But first, I'll tell you one of the reasons I like John. Okay? Um, and, and I guess if someone w- would tell me, hey, I want to start reading the Bible, tell me where to start. Okay? I said, I'd like for you to start two places. I'd like for you, if you're going to read the Old Testament, I want you to read Proverbs. Okay? I want you to read one chapter of Proverbs a day, each day. Start on day one, the 1st of October, read Proverbs chapter 1. The 2nd of October, read Proverbs chapter 2. The 3rd of October, and you got 31. That covers your Old Testament for a month. You got a lot of wisdom literature in there. You don't have all the begets, so-and-so begets, so-and-so, and so-and-so. You don't have all that begets stuff people bog down with. So it's a good place to start. And the second thing is, I'd like for you to read the New Testament, but I'd like for you to read the Gospel of John. I want you to start with John. Because okay? a lot of people want to start with Matthew. And guess what? The verse, first chapter of Matthew, you've got the oldest begets right in there, something like that. And we're sort of familiar with the nativity story that people pull out of that for Matthew and from Luke. But I, I want you to read John. And this is the reason I want you to read John. And it's found in John chapter 20, verse 31. This is John writing. And if you're a person, and I really debate it because this is a, I've had this translation for a while. I haven't written in it, hadn't made any notations in it. And I thought, do I'm going to do that? So I went ahead and start writing in it. Okay. So I'm one person who writes my Bible. I'll admit that. I, I underline, I highlight, I, you know, dog ear pages and stuff like that. But here's the verse. John chapter 20, verse 31. But these things were written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the God. Then by believing, you may have life through his name. John says, I wrote this so that you'll believe. What greater motivation. What greater understanding. So this is, this is like John's reason. This is his motivation. This is why I'm writing this so that you'll believe. And so not just believe, but that you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing they have life through his name. I mean, that's just exciting to me. That, 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 that's it. And so, so my belief is that I can trust John and the Holy Spirit, that I've, if I can get someone to read John, guess what? Something wonderful may happen. That they may connect to Jesus and fully accept him as the Son of God, and they may have life through his name. So that, that that's 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 where I'm that's that's why I chose this, I guess. And I, I just love what John did there. So in, in John chapter one, the very first chapter, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were made by him, and nothing was made without him. In him there was life, and that life was the light of all the people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overpowered it. You see, John goes all the way back to the beginning. In fact, he goes all the way back to the very beginning. If you, if you look in, the, in, in your Bibles in Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was outformed and, and void and darkness was the face of the deep. Then God said, let there be light and there was light. John goes back and starts the story over again. Now, I, 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 I'll confess, I'm a remote hog at home. Okay, bless her heart. Sometimes Tammy, I mean, I, I'm not only a remote hog, but I put it where she can't even reach it. You know, if, if I get it, I'll, let, I'll put it over here to the right, my right, and she's way over there. Okay. But, but, but one reason I like a remote, okay, and, and I've got where we TiVo a whole lot. Okay. And I like that little backwards button that you got with Dish, and we have Dish Network, your backwards button, because Tammy, bless her heart, she said, what'd they say? So sometimes I go backwards and she can hear it again. I can turn it up and she can hear it again, you know. Or, 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 you know, I didn't quite catch it myself. And I love that rewind feature. Don't you like that rewind feature? You can rewind it. You know, you can rewind it. You know, I, 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 we walked yesterday and I, and, and I told Tammy, I said, I, I smelled so bad I couldn't stand myself. So I went and take a shower, but the vols were on, okay. And they were doing pretty good in that fourth quarter. And I thought, well, I'll go ahead and get a shower because I always rewind and catch it. And it was just, it wasn't worth rewinding, okay. It was sort of pitiful, Okay. But, but the reality is that what John does, he hits the rewind button. He not, he not just goes back. He doesn't start with when Jesus' birth, not like Matthew and Luke do and Mark. But he goes all the way back to the beginning of time. 
He puts Jesus in the beginning. So when God said in Genesis chapter 1, let us make man in our image, guess who he's referring to? He's referring to Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And so John goes, all, he hits the rewind button. He says, listen, people, I'm going to tell you Jesus, but I'm going to go all the way back to the beginning. All the way back. So it's very important. Remember in Genesis chapter 1, and darkness was on the, upon the face of the deep. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. John even begins incorporating that language in the beginning. He said, you know, he said the, the light came, but, but people couldn't comprehend it. In fact, the darkness, though, couldn't consume the light. So John goes back and, and hits the reset button all the way back before time began. Then there was a man named John. Verses 6. This verse 6. Who was sent by God. He came to tell the people the truth about the light. So that through him all people could hear about the light and believe. John was not the light. But he came to tell people the truth about the light. The true light that gives light to all was coming in the world. The Word was in the world. And the world was made by Him. But the world did not know Him. He came to the world that was His own. But His own people did not accept Him. But to all who did accept Him and believe, He gave them the right to become children of God. That, that they did not uh, become His children in any human way. But any human parents or human desires, they were born of God. You see, John came to talk to us about the light. And Jesus is the light. And Jesus came to this world <coughs> so that those who would believe on him, he gave them the right to become the children of God. Verse 14. The world became a human and lived among us. We saw his glory, the glory that belongs to the only son of the father. And he was full of grace and truth. John tells us the truth about him and cries out saying, this is the one I told you about. The one who comes after me is greater than I am because he was living before me. You see in the the King James and, and most of the other translations said and he became flesh and dwelt among us. This contemporary version says and he became flesh or, or he became human and made his dwelling among us. It's sort of an interesting turn of phrase there. The word translated to dwell among us is actually the same word from which you get the word tabernacle. In fact, it'd be quite okay to say, and he tabernacled among us. He, he took on the earthly tent and put it on and lived amongst us. He pitched his tent amongst us. And we remember what the tabernacle does. It was a place of meaning. It was a place of God's presence. And the children of Israel took it with them throughout the wilderness. But this time, the tabernacle came and lived amongst us. Jesus came amongst us. And then he says, even John referring to John the Baptist saying, listen, he's saying that he was he was from the beginning. John says he's greater than I am because he was from the very beginning. He was with God. Not since the creation of the world. Had God ever moved in such monumentous ways. I mean, that, that's a pretty big statement. When we think about how God cared the children of Israel on dry land through the sea. And, and how God provided them, as we talked about this morning, manna in the wilderness. And, and, and how, how God did these all these awesome and great things. And how God, God just, you know, Elijah on the mountaintop praying that God sent fire down from heaven. And God sent fire down and consumed the altar. All these things we see. But, but none of that compares to what God did when Christ came. None of that compares. Because God took on flesh and lived among us. 
God, who is much higher than we are and holy, he actually, he actually humbled himself, Paul says, and took on the form of a servant. And so here we have God moving in such a powerful way, as John sees. Verse 16. But he was full of grace and truth. From him were received one gift after another. The law was given through Moses. But grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. But God, the only Son, is very close to the Father. And he has shown us what God is like. On one occasion, the apostles came to Jesus to show us the Father. And Jesus says, how, how long have I been with you? He said, if, if you have seen me, you've seen the Father. We talked a few weeks ago about the ideal of, of, of praxis, that, that, that part of the gospel is asking us not just to believe, but to practice. And, and to know how God is like, we have to see Jesus. And to know how to be like Jesus, what do we need? We need to follow his pattern to be like God. Because he was God, son in the flesh. Verse 19. Here's a truth that John, the, the truth John told when the leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him, who are you? John spoke freely and did not refuse to answer. He said, I'm not the Christ. So they asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? He answered, no, I'm not. Are you the prophet? They asked and he answered, no. Then they said, who are you? Give us an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? John told them in the words of the prophet Isaiah. I am the voice of one calling out in the desert. Make the road straight for the Lord. Some of the Pharisees who had sent asked John, who had been sent asked John, if you're not the Christ or Elijah or the prophet, why do you baptize people? John answered, I baptize with water. But there is one here with you that you don't know about. He is the one who comes after me. I'm not good enough to untie the strings of his sandals. Verse 38, 28 says, This all happened at Bethany. On the other side of the Jordan River was John was baptizing people. Verse 17 says something very important. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth through Jesus Christ. Brother Jerry, in this prayer a few moments ago, prayed for the realization of the grace that we have, that, 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 that through Jesus we have, as, as this translation says, one gift after another. That, 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 that it's like, you know, one of those occasions where people have a really big box and they open it up and there's a gift inside, but there's no gift inside that. And they keep going and keep going and keep going. For in Christ, we have all things that we need. What the law could not do, Jesus could. Verse 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I was talking about when I said a man will come after me, but he is greater than I am because he was living before me. Even I did not know who he was. Although I came baptizing waters so the people of Israel would know he is. Then John said, I saw the Spirit come down from heaven in the form of a dove, and rest on him. Until then, I did not know that he that who was who was the who the Christ was. But the God who sent me to baptize with water told me, "You will see the Spirit come down and rest on him. He is the one who baptized with the Holy Spirit. I've seen this happen, and I tell the truth. This man is the Son of God." See, John says, listen, he says, I came here 
on a mission. I came here to spread the message about the one who was coming after me. And he says, I really didn't know for sure who this person was going to be. But I know that I was told by God that when I saw the Spirit sent upon this man, this would be the Christ. He said, and when I baptized him and I saw the Spirit of sin, I knew he was the one. But again, even John the Baptist is pointing us all the way back to the beginning of time. You know, when, when John said this, behold, or look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You see, his followers and the people that day were very familiar with his practice. Now, we know that the sacrificial system required a lot of blood and required a lot of animals. And, and when he referred to, to, to Jesus as a sacrificial lamb who takes not away just the sin of the penitent person that, that's making the sacrifice, but all the sin of everyone who will believe. You see, when they heard this, they, they heard something very profound and very important because in one man, everyone's sin will be atoned for. That Jesus becomes that sacrificial lamb. What clearly John is trying to bring out, the reality is that sin brings death. And sacrifice brings atonement. And when John made that proclamation that day, that behold or hold or see, look, it's the Lamb of God. Anyone who had the insight realized that that Lamb must die. That's how the sacrificial system worked. Uh, lambs and, and goats and, and bulls and, and all these various animals were sacrificed. They, they, they must die to atone for the sin, to bring at one meant atonement, at one meant with God. So the lamb must die. The writer John brings a transition in the last part. Verse 35, then the next day, John was there with two of his followers. When they saw Jesus walking by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. The two followers heard John say this, so they followed Jesus. When Jesus turned and saw them and uh, saw them following him, he asked, what are you looking for? They said, Rabbi, where are you staying? Rabbi simply means teacher. Then he answered, come and see. So the two men went with Jesus and saw where he was staying and stayed there with him that day. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. One of the two men who followed Jesus after they heard John speak about him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. The first thing that Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and say to him, we have found the Messiah. And the Messiah means Christ. Then Andrew took Simon to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You'll be called Cephas. For Cephas means Peter. Cephas is, means rock in Aramaic. And that's what Jesus calls him. He said, we'll call you rock. The next day, verse 43, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, follow me. Philip was from the town of Bethsaida, where Andrew and Peter lived. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the man that Moses wrote about in the law. And the prophets also wrote about him. He is Jesus, the son of Joseph from Nazareth. But Nathanael said to Philip, Can anything good come from Nazareth? Philip answered, Come and see. As Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him, 
he said, here is truly an Israelite, Israelite in whom there's nothing false in him. Nathaniel asked, how do you know me? And Jesus answered, I saw you when you were under the fig tree before Philip told you about me. Then Nathanael said to Jesus, teacher, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Jesus said to Nathanael, do you believe simply because I told you I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than that. And Jesus said to them, I will tell you the truth. You will all see heaven open and the angels of God coming down, going up and coming down on the Son of Man. See, John progresses from the beginning to the baptism of Jesus by John down to Jesus calling his disciples and, and we end at the, at the last of chapter 1. Now, there's always sort of an interesting thing here. <laughs> when Nathaniel said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Now, Nazareth was some little small town. It was a little hill country town. It was rather insignificant. It wasn't large. It, 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 wasn't, it wasn't big. It, it was nothing of any importance. No one famous ever came from Nazareth. No, nothing big ever seemed to happen there. But Jesus was born in that. Jesus was of Nazareth, born in Bethlehem, but as of Nazareth. And they say this is where he's from. And, and, and Thaniel says, well, can anything really good come from such a small town? Can anything important, can, can anything happen? And what's interesting that, that really Nathaniel echoes what Jesus says when he was asked by the, by, by the follower, Master, where are you staying? Or teacher, and he says, well, come and see. So he says, come and see. Come and see. A few years ago, a, a man translated parts of the New Testament uh, into contemporary situations. And, 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 and what he did, he put the whole context of the New Testament into the civil rights movement of the South in the 1960s. Uh, and so he, he, put, he took, changed names, you know, uh, and, 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 and his translation, he changed Jerusalem to Atlanta, you know. Uh, and so in his translation, called the Cotton Patch Translation, Jesus is from Valdosta. And so the question is, can anything good come from Valdosta? So I never go to Florida without thinking, you know, can anything good come from Valdosta? You know, so I don't know how people from Valdosta feel about that. But, but the reality is, is that can anything good from, come from such an insignificant beginning? And I guess tonight as we sort of wrap this up, I guess we sort of have to look at ourselves and remember that good things come from small towns. You know, one of the things that, that since we've moved to, the, to this new location on, on the highway, uh, I have a lot of people ask about the church and we're much more visible than, than we are. Uh, and they wonder, well, how many people go there? And then I said, well, we got two, two, 250 on Sunday. Really? You know, I, I think it's surprising to people that we're sort of out, out in the middle of, of, of nowhere, to, so to speak, and yet a church has grown up. And I, I don't know, and, and, and I hope it, 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 it's, it doesn't sound arrogant or haughty, but I put our church up, our campus and, and, and our people up against any church around. Any church. And what's done that? It's the work of God. Faithful stewards and leadership and, and faithful Christians committing to the word. So hopefully you're going to find this study productive as we go through. Uh, and uh, I guess the fourth Sunday night, Lord willing, that we will look at the second chapter of John. And we'll just continue that chapter by chapter on these Sunday nights that I preach as we go through. This morning we talked about the Sabbath. And how in the Ten Commandments. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy uh, was one of the commandments that, that God gave the children of Israel to follow. And yet we come down the New Testament and we don't see that commandment restated. We don't see that one. We see all the other ones restated in some form, but that's the one commandment we don't see restated. 
And the reality is, is that the reason we don't see that restated is because Sabbath no longer remained a, man, remained a day, but became a man. That Jesus became our Sabbath of rest. In fact, this afternoon I was reflecting on my lesson this morning a little bit, and I realized I left out one of the passages I meant to, to put in the lesson that sort of illustrates who Jesus is and that he is our rest. On one occasion, Jesus invited his followers with this invitation. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in spirit and you will find rest for your souls. Jesus embraced the identity of being our Sabbath. So, here this evening, as you recognize our Lord and Savior, the Lord of the Sabbath, if you're here tonight and you need a prayer on your behalf, or perhaps here tonight, and maybe there's someone here that's never named Jesus your Savior, would like to confess Him as your Savior, and, and, and as, as John recognized Him as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And as John says, I write these things to so you might believe, and in believing, have hope of eternal life. If you want to lay claim to that tonight, won't you come to me stand and sing the song, Brother Chris, announced earlier.